Thank you. The moderator for this first panel for our afternoon session is the Dean of the Faculty of Engineering and Applied Technology at the Caribbean Maritime University, an engineer in every way, and somebody who thinks in figures. So I hope you'll understand him as he speaks to you this evening, because he has to use words. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the podium Mr. Peter McCarthy, who will introduce to you his panel for the afternoon. Good afternoon, ladies, gentlemen. Um, all protocols observed. Welcome back to this afternoon session. And in this session, we have four presenters who will be presenting to you shortly the modus operandi, because um, we want to ensure that we don't bore you. So we are going to try to get through this session as quickly as possible because there's another session after this. And so I'm going to ask my panelists to stick to the time, which is 10 minutes. And uh, we will ensure, and I know um, everybody has agreed, to that time, we will have the four presentations. Um, First, and if you have questions, you reserve them until the end of the presentations. So whatever questions you will have for each panelist, you can write them down and at the end of the um, presentations, you can direct your questions to whichever of the presenters you want to direct them to. Our first presenter for the afternoon will be Dr. Melissa Williams Longmore. She holds a bachelor's degree, degree in biotechnology from the University of the West Indies. She further obtained a doctorate in biotechnology from the University of the West Indies from the um, Faculty of Medical Sciences. Her area of interest is in diabetes, where she has done quite a bit of work. And today, she will be telling you a little bit more about our work in that area. So at this time, we're going to welcome our first presenter, Dr. Melissa Williams Longmore. Pleasant afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for having me, and thank you for such a lovely introduction. Um, I'm just waiting for the presentation to be uploaded. You know, this does not count for my 10 minutes. Just saying. And bear with me if I have to stop two seconds, you know, to breathe a little. All right. Um, so as mentioned before, um, we're switching up the pace just a little. We're going to be talking about some medical things, I think, on this panel. And I'll be kicking it off. So um, I did, well, one of my research was based on the concept of a new therapy, and it's called biomagnetic therapy. And specifically, I looked at... I looked at um, biomagnetic therapy in diabetes, as well as the potential uses in nanotechnology. Um, just a minute. Still not counting my minutes. OK. All right, so before we get into it, I want you to just look at this number, and I want you to think about the first word that comes to mind. Don't say it yet, okay? Just think about a word. Where do I point? All right, got it. So, 
First, I will just tell you a little about why I chose to do this work. Then we're going to look at what biomagnetic therapy is and then the aim of our experiment, um, the hypotheses, and of course our results and our conclusions. So remember that big number? What was the first word that popped into your mind? Money? <laughs> well, kind of. Another, another word. Diabetes. I was hoping one of these words would be like, you know, huge, big. Because the truth is simple. I think there's a lot of complicated minds here. But the truth is, this number actually represented the amount of persons who were suffering from diabetes in the world. And the year is not now. This was from 2014. And they predicted, this, they predi they predicted that by 2030, you know, we were supposed to be in this region of 422. However, that's not the case anymore. We're in the 600 um, million zone. So you can actually see that diabetes is one of the most prominent diseases, not just in the world, but actually in Jamaica. When you walk and you see the billboards, when you watch TV, they're talking about this all the time. So what is diabetes? It is a group of metabolic diseases um, categorized by high sugar, as we call it, right? And the leading type, there's many different types, but the leading type is type 2 to be exact. And the reason for this is because usually we get type 2 diabetes because we don't really watch what we eat, you know? We like our sugary things, our carbs. So because of that, our pancreas, which is the organ that needs to release what we call insulin to break down the sugar, can't really function how it should be functioning. And then you now have an elevated amount of glucose in your body and you get some organ damage, thus diabetes. So you can see why we needed to do this research. We, we really needed to see what can we do to kind of get away from the medicines because the medicines are very expensive for some persons. So is there something that we can do that is somewhat alternative? Food, is food an option? You know, plants or plants an option? Or can we come up with, you know, a different type of therapy? And this is where biomagnetic therapy came in. So what is biomagnetic therapy? I think everybody probably asking that now. So it's really an alternative um, medicinal practice invol involving what we call static magnets. And uh, the truth is, it's really nothing new. Asian people used to, to do this all the time. The Egyptians used to go and find a stone and put it on their forehead and they feel better. So with a lot of research, we realized that some researchers and some scientists are looking into this therapy to say, hey, can magnets really help people to get better, right? However, nobody really actually figured out what the biochemical or what the changes in the body, what these magnets can actually do to make these changes and therefore better condition. And that is where our team came in. So let us look at, remember that breath? Hold on. <laughs> All right. So let us look at the claims behind biomagnetic therapy. So think about your body, right? When your body is happy and healthy and your cells are healthy, overall, they actually emit, um, they have charges, and these charges are neutral. So think about like a battery, a positive, positive and a negative charges, right? Within our cells, we have these ions and these channels, but everything's, everything is in sync, it's in balance. But then when something happens and it becomes damaged, these, these charge are said to go out of range, and then your body responds via inflammation. And that is where the magnets are said to help. One, they can go in and help to realign the polarity of these cells, right? And this is one of the primary claims. By realigning the polarity of the cells, you help to, what? Get the body to heal a little faster. Another thing is that it actually helps to separate the red blood cells so that there's easier flow. So with that being said, this was a concept um, that one of our team members, Professor Elvira Williams, she actually worked with NASA. She created those little panels on the, on the spaceships, right? Yeah. So she actually came up with this concept, and 
Just imagine that this is in your vein and you see the ions there, the blood. By exposing your blood to um, a certain level of magnetic field, you actually have an easier flow overall of the blood. So if you have greater flow of this blood, right, going to these damaged organs, you can imagine that you will help to speed up your recovery. Another diagram just to show you. See the little bloods, the blood down the cells? Yeah, all right. So now, what really happened? I tried to find any type of research overall to say that this is actually true or this is not true. We realized that the research done was extremely indecisive. One person said that, hey, it can help with fracture repair. And another person said, nope, it definitely did not help with fracture repair. We did not want to prove it or disprove it. We just wanted to see what was happening overall. You know, like true scientists. So this was our aim. We wanted to see the effect of, the, of biomagnetic therapy, and we chose a condition because you have to know something to study it. So we chose diabetes, and you know why, the 422 million people, right? And then we also wanted to see what the effect would be on the blood glucose levels and see is it really significant in helping to treat a diabetic person. And eventually, how can we use this for future, you know, technology, like nanotechnology? A second breath. <sighs> Okay, so hypotheses. Diabetic rats under biomagnetic therapy would indi um, indicate diabetic indices towards normal glycemic conditions. Sounds confusing, you know, for all the non-medical people. It's simply saying when they are exposed to the magnets, they should have normal blood glucose level. That's what we're thinking. Yes, and I worked with a lot of rats. I don't like them anymore. I love them then. Not anymore. So these are Sprague rats. And it was like, what, 200 every day we had to poke them. So the first step is that we had to identify what is considered a medicinal um, magnet. So we did certain type of research, certain type of, of test, and we realized the strength of the magnet is usually between 1,000 gauze, that's what they measure it in, to 10,000 gauze. So we chose 5,000 gauze to really see what's happening. The second step is to gather our equipment and our reagent. And of course, the next thing is to get their blood, you know, to figure out what's happening, to get their organs out, you know, to see if there's any changes. And this is what we found. And I think it's actually pretty, pretty remarkable the first time we saw this result. So we had a lot more groups for this because of my 10 minutes. We only presented on four groups, all right? So we have our diabetic rats um, that had on those magnets. We had our non-diabetic rats with the magnets and normal diabetics by themselves and non-diabetics by themselves. This is just some of the pictures from our experiment. So we tested the non-fasting blood glucose level. Then as I said, we harvested what we needed to harvest to do a bunch of biochemical testing. All right, so really fast, let's look at this. So this is showing us um, what really happened with that blood glucose over the period. So we did it for like 16 weeks. And what you're seeing, the red, you can tell what that one is. Those rats were diabetic and were on nothing. So their blood glucose level was very high. Then the bottom lines are showing our controls, the, the non-diabetics with the magnets and the diabetics with the magnets. And you can see the yellow line, it's kind of pale, but the yellow line were the diabetic rats that actually had the magnets. And you can see it basically went down to normal glycemic levels, which is like you want it below five, between six, five. All right? Uh, this clicker is not working with me for some reason. <laughs> and I'm stressed out with my 10 minutes. <laughs> All right. So this here is another representation. You can see where the group, the diabetic group that were with the magnets at the beginning of the experiment, that blue is showing you what their blood glucose level was. And then the yellow is showing you what happened at the end. And it really speaks for itself. Something was happening overall. 
And then when we looked at the organs, I'm just, I'm just gonna show you two, four pictures in total. This one is showing you your pancreas, right? And the pancreas, as I mentioned before, is very important because they have specialized cells called the beta cells that will produce your insulin, which is what we need to break down the glucose, right? However, let us look at what happened in our normal non-diabetic with the biomagnetic therapy. You notice that cluster there, they're called islet of Langerhans, which has those beta cells. Very nice and fat, looking great. The bottom one is showing you diabetic without anything, you know, no biomagnetic therapy, and it's not looking too great. So it's showing you that there's definitely damage going on with your, you, with your diabetic rats. I skipped, sorry, I skipped. Okay, so I'm just going to go, go on. You can't see the, the other one. The other one would have shown you. I'm not even pressing it anymore. <laughs> I just want me to reach conclusion. Are you pressing something back there? Okay. All right, so the other picture would have shown you the ones that were treated with the biomagnetic therapy, the diabetics. It would have actually... Um, look more normal like the ones that were non-diabetic. And this was very significant findings because if we can start to reverse the condition in the pancreas overall, you can imagine that for diabetics, imagine just wearing a bracelet or you know, wearing two bracelets and it can help with your medication or maybe without your medication to actually control the condition. Who, who pressed the slide a while ago? Yes, thank you. All right, so some other significant things that we found. Um, this is the biochemical part. I'm not going to talk about everything. There is another test that we can do that is called your glycated hemoglobin level, your HbA1c level. This is just a little further dive to see what is happening with your blood glucose level over a longer period of time. And it definitely showed the same results like the instant testing. All right? And then we looked at cholesterol because most people who are diabetic tend to be, you know, have the high cholesterol. It was good. It showed that there was a reduction with that group that actually had those magnets, you know, around their waist. You see, something was wrong. They fixed it. All right. So then we also looked at um, something to assess the free radicals. Free radicals tend to damage cells. And we realized that it was in favor also for those that were diabetic and were exposed to the magnets overall. And remember I spoke about the Langerhans and the beta cells in the pancreas? There was one more um, significant finding, uh, which was within the liver. And these are called Kuffa cells. This is a part of our innate immune system. And if we see these activated in our liver, it means that we are doing something good, our immune system is fighting against something. It's speeding up the process of healing. And we saw an increase of these Kuffa cells within the group that had the magnets. So in conclusion, I bet you know what the conclusion is. Um, biomagnetic therapy can definitely help to facilitate the maintenance and um, the management of type 2 diabetes by lowering the blood glucose level and also helping the further effects of it, such as organ changes. Now, I spoke about nanotechnology. Don't worry, it's just two. You see, it's finished already. It's two slides. So one of the things, I don't have to go back. It's fine. One of the things with what we were moving forward or what we're moving forward with from this research is that nanotechnology basically takes um, how do I put it? Any significant findings, and you can, once you can reduce it to the size of your cell, it's considered nanotechnology. So there's actually a lot of experiments being done where these, these little, think about, some people think about robots, right? Like drug delivery systems, they actually have magnetic parts already. So what some persons are doing, and what we also want to do, um, is to see 
if these properties within the biomagnetic therapy can be incorporated with the nanotechnology aspect, that would be good. We can have diabetic drug delivery system, right? That's one. And there was actually somebody who released something pretty recently that was very close to this, where they developed a drug delivery system using magnets. So they put it in your blood and they direct it where it can go. So that's basically, basically it. I'm not gonna talk too much about the nanotechnology part, but I do hope that you enjoyed this presentation, all the hiccups, and you learned something. <laughs> Thank you. All right, Dr. Langmore. I think that was a very interesting presentation. Um, and I know a lot of persons may want to ask questions a little later. At this time, <laughs> we are going to have our second presenter, which is Miss Kishana Bell. She's a past student of the Caribbean Maritime University, where she pursued and obtained Bachelor's of Engineering in Industrial Systems. She is currently working at a private power plant as a plant operator. Um, she was a very active member in the GIE chapter. In fact, she was the president of the GIE chapter, student chapter at the Caribbean Maritime University while she was a student there and still a member of the GIE. At this time, without any further ado, I ask you to welcome Miss Ishana. Well. So good afternoon. Afternoon. So for today's presentation, we're going to focus on energy management in the 21st century. Um, unlocking energy saving potential for micro, small, and medium enterprises in Jamaica. So it is important to note that MSMEs in Jamaica, they make up at least 97% of tax paying businesses in the island, right? And they also account for 80% of jobs that are created. So you know, decreasing poverty by job creation. Right, so for these, most of these establishments, they operate on a brick and mortar system. So that means they have a physical structure for how they operate their business. And with that, considering that, it is, we need to consider power power usage, electricity usage for said business. Cool? Right? Right. <laughs> um, and it is also important to note that the cost of electricity in Jamaica is one of the highest in the world at, 47, at 41 US cents per kilowatt. Yeah. <laughs> So the case study or, or focus for a local SM, SME for today's case study is Lama Service Company Limited. So Lama is a 40-year-old family company and they manufacture beverages. So syrups, wines, coconut water, etc. So we're just going to review the utilities, water, energy communications, all of that contribute to the energy usage. <laughs> yeah. So our energy audit, as the name suggests, it is we just do, we did an investigation on how the client or the company uses their energy. So we we'll focus on the JPS bills from current, for the, from the current bills to previous years or months, all of that. We we'll focus on what type of renewable energy that they use. We we'll focus on the different equipment on their, on their site, the, the number of persons there. So we we'll look on every little thing to come to a conclusion as to how they are accurately using their energy.
And the method that we used was a level two energy audit. So just reiterating, we examine the energy usage, we identify areas in which they can save, as well as we collect data, and then we prepare and we present the audit report to the company, and then we benchmark. And on the screen, you can just see the satellite view of the companies off Hagley Park Road. Yeah, right there. And then you're seeing a 2D view of the facility. And the main breaker and their sub panels. What you see now is just highlighting the different stages of their product production. So just going through the first set of pictures, following the arrows. So the first picture highlights the filtration system, then the bags of sugar that they use to mix the syrup. And then the tank shows the agitator that they use to, you know, mix. <laughs> and then below you see the syrup that they use, that they're actually that they that they've actually mixed. Continuing, you see the storage for the wine. And then the last picture shows their cold rooms. And these are new additions to the site. So of course, it will significantly affect their power usage. And from our research, from, from the data that we collected, their energy distribution it went, the highest is at, or is relating to the cold rooms, AC, the AC systems. And the graph below shows that when we completed the energy audit in December 2022, right, gave them the recommendations, we can assume, it is safe to assume that their energy usage, you know, by our recommendation, it reduced significantly so and then energy management opportunities that we recommended to the client is implementing rainwater harvesting you know saving the, using less water from nwc again saving and uh, i'm just highlighting too <laughs> and then ha also installing Solar, that can also be a renewable energy. And saving, you know, it's all about saving, energy management. <laughs> all right, and a few limitations is access to funding because DBJ does give access to energy audits. Another one is the amount of certified energy managers in Jamaica. And just to conclude, I hope I'm within my 10 minutes. <laughs> um, just to conclude that once energy efficiency is considered for M SMEs, of course, we're, they're saving money, hence they can be more competitive locally as well as globally. Thank you for listening. Before I move on, let me thank Ms. Kishana Bell for her presentation. And I remember a story I used to read while I was in primary school about a guy by the name of Nas. And he met this beautiful young woman. They got married and started a family. So when the baby arrived in the picture, Nas would come home in the evenings, watch TV, and then go to sleep. So the wife had to be up with the baby, nursing all night. So one night she said to Nas, I want you to rock the baby for me tonight so I can get some rest. Nas looked at her and said, but that's your job. 
she looked at us and she said, well, the baby is half mine and half yours. So you have a responsibility as well to rock the baby. And I looked at her and said, well, let me tell you how we can fix the problem. You rock your half. My half not bothering me. <laughs> you went to sleep. Um, your guess is as good as mine. How oh, that relationship turned out. So far, <laughs> so far, uh, my presenters are working with me. They are not taking the, the, the route that NAS took. So we move now to the third <laughs> presenter, um, which is Dr. Kawuna Miller. Kawuna, Dr. Miller holds a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from the University of Technology. He also holds two master's degrees in logistics, one from the World Maritime University and one from the Caribbean Maritime University. And he also has a doctor's a doctorate from University of Tokyo, yes, in logistics engineering. He is currently the head of the Department of Engineering at the Caribbean Maritime University. I want you to welcome Dr. Miller. All right. I put this up. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Just that everybody's doing okay. All right. Now, we all talk about our energy bill, and we're not tackling GPS in any way. We're trying to create a solution here. So, my topic is solving energy, solving energy economic crisis. Could Jamaica be the next hydrogen hub? Let's see. Now, the Caribbean is popular known for beaches, tourism, but we have a secret, which is the sustainable management of our ocean resources. And this is what we call the blue economy. Little did we know that the same ocean has the potential to give us energy from harvesting it from the sea, which is hydrogen. Now, in terms of blue economy, it has three segments. We have the seafood and the marine production. We have the offshore engineering and renewable energy. And so we'll look at for this segment, we look at renewable energy and offshore engineering. Now, in terms of the generation of green hydrogen from the sea, we're going to look at the concept of chemistry in which we extract hydrogen from the sea using what we call the electrolysis. All right? So the electrolysis requires you to have an anode and a cathode in which energy is used to separate it. Now, as you can see from the diagram, the green symbolizes sustainable energy. And that means um, this energy is clean energy that does not use um, fossil fuels in any way. Now, the broad perspective of, of this research is to see how we can use sustainable energy extract hydrogen from the sea and use it to supply both local and international industries. And so we can tap into the potential of actually supplying energy to cars, households, and the industry, therefore helping GPS. Now, there are three types of Hydrogen production, we have the gray, the green, the blue, and this, in terms of the gray, the gray is when you use natural, natural gas, and the natural gas has a byproduct, which is CO2, which is affecting climate change. Our neighbor, Caribbean neighbor, Trinidad, accounts for 40% of hydrogen gas production within the region. 
but also Trinidad has the highest CO2 emissions in the region. And so we look at ways how to resolve and mitigate the CO2 emissions. So we go to blue. Now blue is basically using natural gas and storing the CO2 emission. All right? So as you know, this can be expensive. However, going green, we use renewable energy using our seawater, and the byproduct is just oxygen and hydrogen. Now, as we look at this segment, this is just uh, schematics of what is produced. Now, in terms of production costs, to produce blue hydrogen um, for natural, um, natural energy, it's 50 to 65%. In looking at the operation or capex, which is the capital expenditure, we see it at seven, oh, sorry, 17 to 22 percent. And as it relates to the operation cost, it ranges from 3 to 8 percent. Now, looking at the cost of storage of the carbon dioxide, it is 2 to 4 percent. And transportation plus storage is 7 to 10 percent. Now, looking at green hydrogen, no. green hydrogen will be more expensive. So, we're looking at the renewable energy, which is 50 to 65 percent of the, the green energy costs. We look at also the capex, which is basically the electrode, the electrolysis, is actually 30. To 35 percent and for the operations and maintenance and also the extraction of the sea which is water we see where you can the the, the cost is 12 to 15 percent however the margin and the rate of of return is from 8 to 12 percent now with that being said overall we can say the blue may be the way to go but in terms of the cost, we see where to produce green hydrogen, it is actually 3 to 6% per kilogram, whilst blue hydrogen has a lower cost, which is $2.08 to $3.50 per kilogram. Now, the good sign is this. It is anticipated that green energy costs will reduce from $6.00 to one dollar per kilogram in 2030 based on the technologies that we have available now. Now, looking at Jamaica, we all complain about our utility rate. Jamaica is actually the 19th highest electricity price um, per household. And that is our figure from 2022. Earlier, it was fourth in the world in 2014. So we see where customers are feeling the pinch. Now, in looking at the whole aspect of offshore engineering, we see where the ports in itself can play a strategic role in regards to the supply chain of green energy. Jamaica is surrounded by water, so we will call this the green oil. Now, ports has always played a critical role in economic development within our country. As the ports develop, so will the economy. So in Hamburg, Hamburg actually exports, they generate green energy from renewable sources. Therefore, they are able to export green energy right across Europe. And it's the same model we would like Jamaica to, to move upon. And so, this will help also to reduce the CO2 emissions from ships because IMO is planning to, to, to bring in ships that actually use hydrogen as the energy source. Now, in terms of our methodology, we will, we will only focus on countries that are within the triangular region, which is the busiest area um, within the Caribbean tri transshipment triangle. 
And this includes Jamaica, which is the Kingston port. We're looking at Panama, the port of Cologne. We're looking also on Bahamas. We look also on Barbados. Dominican Republic and Trinidad. So in looking at the GDP, we see where from years 2010 to 2020, we realize Jamaica has been on a low path. And we would like it to be in, increased, just as we see with Don Rep and also with Panama. So one thing we have to look at, the correlation, is, is there a correlation between energy and energy production and also is there a correlation between renewable energy and economic growth so we had to use these variables if you look at these variables in terms of the 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 renewable energy generation or capacity we see where jamaica which is listed in the blue it is it's increasing but it is it is it is minute in comparison to panama and Dominican Republic. In terms of our renewable power generation, we're progressing very slowly, but when compared to Panama and Dominican Republic, it is relatively low. In terms of our alternative um, and nuclear um, percentage in terms of total energy that has been stated earlier, Jamaica is third, but there is room for improvement. Now, Trinidad is, as we see, has the highest in terms of CO2 emission because most of the time the, the CO2 emission reflects the economic activity and also the generation of oil production. Now, looking at the port infrastructure, which is sad to say, we see where Jamaica is actually trending down in that area, but our neighbor, Dominican Republic, is trending up. And so we look at even the aspect of even poor traffic, which is the number of containers that comes to the island. We see where Jamaica is trending down and Dominican Republic is trending upwards. Now, looking at Panama, Panama was always on top. Now, looking at the line of connectivity, meaning the ships that are attracted to the port, we see where... Um, Jamaica is lowered. Now, in looking at the, the Pearson correlation, we see that there's a high correlation with Jamaica as it regards to renewable energy. Looking at Trinidad, we see that Trinidad also have a high correlation as it relates to port infrastructure and port traffic. And with our express service, we'll just speed it up. We see where Trinidad, we see where Dominican Republic and Panama is moving ahead. I hear you, sir. So, <laughs> so in moving on now, conclusions, the findings reveal that overall that Jamaica is lagging. We see where our neighbors, Panama and Dominican Republic, are on top because of their infrastructural development in renewable energy. So we have some recommendations here. We, think, we believe that Jamaica depends too much on, on fossil fuel, in which 90% of the energy um, the government needs to actually improve its renewable energy portfolios. We see where... Um, we must promote production of renewable energy and establish legislative frameworks to support it. Now, as you can see from the map, Jamaica is not within the legislative framework as it relates to green hydrogen. Now, looking at it, we see where we can improve port line of connectivity by increasing port traffic and improving on added value services among our ports. Now, also, green energy production must be promoted along coastal areas in order to facilitate increase in um, employment. Now, also, we're going to look at the blue energy, blue energy,
blue energy, hydrogen energy is considered not realistic because it's expensive to import fuel. But we see green hydrogen production as feasible because of Jamaica's strategic position. Jamaica will also help with IMO emission reduction by having our ports equipped with hydrogen energy. So thank you very much. Okay, thanking Dr. Miller for such a wonderful um, presentation. And um, we are doing well. At this time, we are down to our final presenter for this session. And our final present presenter will be Miss Sasha Gay Wright. Ms. Sasha Gay Wright received her bachelor's degree in biochemistry from the Faculty of Science and Technology at the University of the West Indies. She then pursued graduate studies at the Faculty of Medical Sciences at UWMONA. And her research for her MPhil and PhD centered around natural products and cancer. And through this work, she visited and collaborated with several international universities. She has since to date phyt phytochemically screened YAM, assessed its anti-cancer effects on both early and advanced stages of prostate cancer, as well as invasive breast cancer cell lines. She's currently appointed as a lecturer and head of program in the Faculty of Engineering, where she conducts investigations into green nanotechnology and drug targeting therapy. Help me welcome Ms. Sasha Gay Wright. All right, good afternoon, everybody. Now, um, I'm not going to talk about cancer, which is really strange, but shameless plug, September is Prostate Cancer Awareness Month. And gentlemen, and, and women too, because we all have fathers and brothers and uncles and friends that we care and love, uh, care about and love very much. And Jamaica has one of the highest rates. And it's linked to not just, you know, our diet and um, the fact that, or, you know, our race, but also because we don't do screenings. So gentlemen, while I'm not going to talk anything about prostate cancer, get screened today. All right. Now, <laughs> I will be talking about um, some of the work that we do in biomedical engineering. So as the, the moderator said, I am from the Faculty of Engineering, specifically biomedical engineering at UE Mona. And we have several projects, one of which is what we call the Epiderma Smart Shield. And we synthesize this smart shield using hydrogels. And I am going to, ooh, it's working for me. All right, so <laughs> I'm going to tell you a little bit about hydrogels and what hydrogels are and why do we need it? Why do we need to make it, all right? Okay, so we're going to start with the skin, all right? And all of us have skin, so even if you don't do biological research, it's applicable to you. So the first part of the skin that I want you to talk, what I want to talk about is the epidermis, and that's the upper layer of the skin. And that is pretty much to um, waterproof our skin. It helps, bar it serves as a barrier for pathogens, helps to keep us safe, right? And you have, you know, um, sweat ducts and everything there. But going further down into the skin, we have the dermis and that is where we have our nerve endings that's where the feelings come from the nerve endings and the sweat glands and your capillaries right and then further down we have your fat and muscle and some some um, books will call that the hypodermis and that is just linking the skin that's where fat is stored gives us insulation and that links the skin to the muscle and why am I telling you all of this because in order to fully understand why we engineer certain biomaterials we need to know what we are replacing all right so we talk a little bit about the skin 
Now, moving on to chronic wounds. What is a chronic wound? Now, ideally, when you get a cut, there are four different stages that your body goes through. It tries immediately to stop the bleeding, and then we have what we call our inflammatory stage. So at some point, some point in your lifetime, you would have had some injury. And I don't know if you can tell me, what's the first thing that happens, you know, after the bleeding? I mean, you see white, yes, you see a scab, but before the scab, or while the scab is there, it feels warm, don't? All right, so that's the inflammatory phase. And it feels warm because your body's putting a lot of blood there to get all of the white blood cells to fight the pathogens. All right, and so your inflammatory stage is supposed to only last for a short time. And so for persons, whether as Dr. Longmore would have spoken about diabetic patients, so diabetic patients sometimes have chronic wounds, meaning their wounds do not heal. They prolong in that inflammatory stage. And so... We have, hold on, so essentially your chronic wound is a wound that does not heal in the orderly set of stages and in the predictable amount of time, all right? And sometimes it doesn't heal within three months. And not only are this, well, not only is this um, applicable to diabetic patients, but also to older persons, persons who have any form of neuropathy, persons who have low blood circulation, it just means that they're not healing in time all right and so ideally we have created our devices to help with that so just to show you um, on the your left you have the healing stage so at the top that's where as we spoke about earlier the epidermis the dermis and there's an injury there and that red part is where the injury is and so the body immediately forms a clot and that clot eventually becomes what we see as a scab yes um, with your healing normal healing pathways um, on what we call an acute wound meaning it goes through the regular pathways we have what we see a migrating tongue meaning you have the scab being formed and then the skin starts to heal itself and it comes, it closes the wound nicely and then you start getting back your melanin for those of, you, those of us who have it. You get your melanin and it looks normal again. But in the non-healing, there's no migration. It's not closing, all right? And so with these chronic wounds, you, it can lead to amputation or even death, all right? And so I've set the ground, don't feel me now, I've set the ground for my hydrogels. So within the faculty, we synthesize certain materials that are able to keep that wound closed. All right, and these are what we call hydrogels. They're gel-like materials. We say they're three-dimensional. They have these little polymer. They have these little chains, this little network. And it will be similar to the network and chains that you'll find on your scabs. So it's easy for us to synthesize these material and use it for these purposes. All right. It was going so well. But again, hydrogels are not unique. Um, we have been using them for several years in the field. Um, they're used for drug delivery in the more modern side of things. But they help with, you see, their hemostasis or anti-inflammatory. So it helps to prolong, or sorry, to push along the healing process. But we in the faculty, well, my research was not was mainly focused on wound monitoring functions. Ah, there we go, wound monitoring functions. So essentially what we're doing is we create a smart bandage. And so for persons who they might be diabetic, they want to monitor their wounds and they don't have the know-how, they don't want to be seeing the doctor every two seconds, every two days they're going to the doctor. Um, we want to create a type of wound monitoring for the layman. So I got um, injury to my arm or to my leg. I'm diabetic. I put on this smart bandage and it's able to tell me, okay, well, is it prolonged in the inflammatory stage? Do I need to see a doctor now? Is it not healing in its normal stages? So here is, that's what we refer to as wound monitoring. All right. So let's see how we actually do this. All right. So in comes our epidermis smart shield and what we've synthesized using hydrogel. So the first thing we wanted to do, because it's the 21st century, 
we wanted to, it to have a range of colors so we know we come in all different colors and we wanted persons to have this range of colors in terms of their bandage we wanted it to be breathable we wanted it to be hyperallergenic meaning it's not irritating the skin in any way and we also it was working so well ah right we also wanted to stop the bleeding ideally right additionally to that because we're engine we're in engineering we wanted it to be smart and how do we do that we we embedded this bandage with a temperature sensor and like i mentioned before when you have a wound you will have you know inflammatory stage will have some heat changes right you will have a fever so it's possible to have a fever in your hand or your leg or wherever you got that that injury and so you're able to monitor to see well okay by monitoring the temperature I'll then able to tell if it's in the inflammatory stage for too long and in addition to that we wanted to implement a strain sensor as well meaning you'll be able to tell if there's any swelling and another form of um, another um, side effect of inflammation or sign of inflammation is swelling all right and then also because again everyone has a phone we wanted to implement the pcb with a bluetooth module that would send the information to an app so i just put on my smart bandage i take up my phone and it tells me again in layman terms how my my my, my wound is progressing all right and then tells me when i need to see the doctor so um and, and then we ensure that we follow the IEEE standards in terms of the creation of this device. Now, I must, in, in the interest of full disclosure, tell you, as my background would have stated, I'm a biochemist, all right? So, I no, I did not create that PCB. My student did. Her name is Rihanna Kennedy, so I wanted to mention her right now. She's an undergraduate student, and this is what the project actually looked like. So, we were able to synthesize the hydrogel, as you can see, using um, different colors. Um, that's what it looks like on the arm before it was embedded or before it was made smart and you can see on the far right where it was um, lined with the sensors and the um, PC connected to the PCB and placed on the leg all right so this smart shield was then able to send information via Bluetooth to the app in terms of its temperature, the patient's temperature, and whether there was any strain. As you can imagine, there might be some strain if you're using it on your leg. When you get up, when you sit down, there might be some movement. And so we would have calibrated the sensors to account for this. There were also a few tests that we ran. Um, the Young's modulus value was 1.29, which pretty much tells us that it's actually a polymer, where able to synthesize that I will not tell you the recipe because we're trying to keep that to ourselves for now commercialize it that's the aim of it right and so but however it was made with completely biodegradable degradable products right and finally I mean we're almost there all right but let me just point my 10 minutes up that's not my fault okay so future work we want a smaller enclosure. So the idea is to create these devices in our Jamaican setting, using our Jamaican materials, but also making it low cost. We want persons to be able to afford these devices. We also wanted to add, add features for wound healing. So we have the knowledge on what we can help, what we can do to help the, the wound to heal faster. So we want to implement those as well. We wanted to include a flexible PCB. So as the one you saw, it was in an enclosure it was not as flexible and so it's not as small so with a flexible PCB it will be a lot smaller and we want it to be as user-friendly as possible so again the complete layman knows nothing about engineering will just because again no one needs to teach you how to use a cell phone we get our cell phones we use it for the most for most people and so we want these devices to be that user-friendly where you take it on you put it on your your body you connect to the app and you're good to go all right, thank you very much for your time. All right, thank, thanking Miss Sasha Gay, right? For such a lovely and interesting um, 
presentation. In fact, all the presentations are very interesting. It's a pity that we have to rush through them <laughs> that quickly. But in the interest of time, we'll, we have to do that. Because there's another session that is coming up um, almost immediately now. Um, I know persons may have a lot of questions. I think we can take about four questions quickly from the, uh, from the audience. All right, there's no questions. Okay, Dr. Deans, <laughs> I see your hand. Oh, it comes up. Sorry. Um, mm -hmm. From the perspective of green hydrogen, its ability to store the energy um, for future use um, is probably where it offers the greatest potential, plus the fact that it is clean. Um, could you give us a little bit more information on the cost structure and the feasibility of hydrogen in order in, for its future implementation? All right. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, um, part of my slide showed the, the comparison cost between the blue. Hello, hello, hello. Your work? Try this. Just speak in the middle. Okay. All right. Yeah, yeah. All right. So, part of my slide showed the difference in terms of the cost between the blue and the green, right? Now, for the green energy, we see we're in terms of the cost breakdown structure in terms of the, the energy, we see it ranges from 50 to 65. When you look at the overall cost, we see where the blue energy, the blue hydrogen uh, production is from $2 to $3.45, whilst the green energy is from three to six. So obviously, the blue energy production is cheap. However, based on the technologies that will be available that are emerging for green energy, it's anticipated that in 2030, the cost could reduce from $6 per kilogram to $1. How does that $6 figure you're quoting compared to other fuels like LNG or, um, um, or that's, 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 that wasn't covered in terms of part of my study. I will just focus on the hydrogen part. But we are looking at the sustainability. We know that Jamaica is 90% um, we import fuels, so we need an alternative energy. And so, in addition to that, we see where hydrogen can be used as an alternative source. So, we are surrounded by the sea, sunlight, why not capitalize? I call it the green oil. So, we can do this along with our friends, JPS. Thank you. <laughs> I have one other question All for right. Dr. Wright. Yes, Dr. Wright. Oh, no, Miss no, Head. Um, yes, go ahead. Well, William Blossom. Oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, the, you had mentioned that the magnets were, what, 5,000 gauze? Did you do test other strengths to see if it had different effects and so? Um, so we actually had. Sorry. Initially, we actually had a. Um, we had a, a specialist on board who did that work before. So yes, it was tested. Um, what we were planning on doing or what we can do, now that we know that the 5,000 definitely had um, some impact, we can always up it. But you know, MRI scans and all that, we definitely don't want to touch the 10,000 and, and above that. It will cause some damage. But for now, for just general use, the 5,000 seem to be effective. All right, so the last question. 
um, the presentation uh, that went earlier, uh, where we were regarded with the whole thing about the LNG and uh, the fossil fuels, the hydro, the wind, and all that, and the presentation about hydrogen as alternative, renewable. Um, part of the challenge has been the investment of the current system and the lobby that protects the investments of the fossil fuel industry and that has made us all concentrate instead of using the resources around us. If Europe were to be in our situation, they will be more invested in solar to make it more renewable and cheaper. But because that is not their interest, we find it difficult to shift focus. And um, the presentation by our, the two gentlemen who spoke about the LNG, Jamaica still has to import the gas, which you have to cool down to that stage where it becomes liquefied natural gas. I'm not an engineer, I'm not a scientist, but simple science tells me that that is not the future of Jamaica because the energy is all around us and that is the point which uh, the last speaker was making about the hydrogen uh, situation. Why do we have a university? Why do we have a university of technology? Why do we have the various faculties of engineering if we don't solve the problems of our societies? Why do we have to wait for the North to come and solve our problems for us? Even when they want to give us resources to do it, some of us are still invested in carrying on as if the future is in the past. Thank you. Very good contribution. I think we'll have to take that up another time, but very um, good points. And I do hope that we are all taking note of it. Um, the points you make are very valid, and it's, these are things that we talk about on a daily basis, <laughs> but um, really need to have op operationalize. Um, you know, some of the thoughts that we do have to solve some of those problems. So at this time, um, I'm going to bring this side to its close. And so I just want to thank our panelists and presenters again. And thank the audience for listening and participating. So I turn this side to, back to Dr. Johnson. <laughs> we have that was interesting it gets more interesting and um, I think I want to talk to Miss Sasha Gay right sometime you know that one was particularly enthralling for me professor spencer we have a discussion to have sir i'm going to invite captain christopher balls forward mr christopher odega and miss Wanika wilson to come to the platform we are going to transition to our final panel for this afternoon where we will be looking at the enhancing the future of maritime through technology so moving from engineering for well-being, the engineers are very eclectic thinkers. Come please. Thank you. Captain 
Ladies and gentlemen, I introduce to you our hardworking president who is taking some of the operational work this afternoon. And he's going to chair this panel on enhancing the future of maritime through technology. He will introduce his panelists and we will go. Thank you very much, Chair. I think I've been given the most uncomfortable position today because they say standing between people and lunch is bad. But I think it's even worse when you're standing between people who are dying to go and have a wonderful tour of the Caribbean Maritime University. It's palpable. I sense it in the room. So I'll ensure that I'm efficient and I know my panelists will help me so to be. Just very quickly to state that I am not usually uncomfortable with many things. One of the things I'm not uncomfortable with is silence, and it usually troubles others because I'm okay with silence. The other thing I'm not uncomfortable with is when I am cheering a panel to come and stand beside you at the podium. In fact, it's common practice for me. I literally, when your time is up, I'll stand beside you at the podium, and I'm quite comfortable doing so. Uh, so, but I know my panelists won't allow me to have to do that today because most of the people in the room think I'm well-mannered. Uh, but uh, on, a, on a more serious note, I'd like to introduce to you today, ladies and gentlemen, a power-packed panel with a topic that, to my mind, captures everything we're trying to achieve at this important industry conference. And anybody who's read my work will know in my body of work that I have a pro-innovation bias. So I'm well-placed to talk about technology today. And these people school me on the elements to do with the maritime components. Today we have Mr. Christopher Udega, got it right. He's a senior lecturer in the School of Computing and Information Technology at the Faculty of Engineering and Computing in the University of Technology. And he will be presenting to us, I have his bio here, but I know he doesn't want me to share all of it with you, other than to say he is uh, well-versed in electronic and com computer engineering, has an MBA, has teacher training, has a Master of Science in Digital Technology, and is a PhD candidate in computer science at this time. I'm going to do this quite differently. I'm introducing my entire panel, and then I will allow them to flow. The only time I come up here is if you know when, right? Okay. We also have Captain Christopher Balls, who we're happy to have. He's a principal surveyor uh, at the Maritime Authority of the Cayman Islands. Let's make him welcome. Chief Marine Surveyor, Antigua and Barbuda, Department of Marine Services and Shipping, Antigua and Barbuda, Department of Marine Science Services, and I assume that was before. All right. I mean, you could have two jobs, but yeah. He has an MSc in Engineering Maritime or Maritime Engineering. And our third power panelist is Ms. Juanica Wilson, who I met for the first time at our recent symposium, who has some very fascinating engineering work, which we are all very proud of. She's an assistant lecturer in the Faculty of Engineering and Applied Technology at the Caribbean Maritime University. She has a BSc in Industrial Engineering. Ladies and gentlemen, I have started to run my clock, and I'd like to invite our first speaker, Mr. Christopher Uduega, to make his presentation within 10 minutes, within meaning 10 or less. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, before I go straight to my presentation, I would like to inform you that many persons think that communication, it is only when we use our telephone and make a call. This is what we call circuit switching. We also have communication in a computer, computer communication, which we send email. We have space communication. And by virtue of the theme of this program, we also have communication on the sea. When we use hydrophone, we are communicating in the sea. We have underwater vehicles, which need to be, which also make communication. Now, 5G technology will bring a lot of things. 
not only to the Jamaica, but to the maritime industry. The only challenge we are having right now is that Jamaica is currently using IPv4, Internet Protocol version 4, whereas I 5G we work at backbone of IPv6, Internet Protocol version 6. Now, if we... Okay, these are areas where the points we are going to look at. Going to the introduction, 6G is currently on the making by researchers in, in the academia. Uh, presently, we do not have 5G in Jamaica but many other countries are having 5G. What, why do we need 5G? A lot of trust, resilience. If 5G will be able to withstand a number of attack, cyber security, a lot of opportunities we are going to get in 5G, also in the maritime industry. Trust is a lot of things we have to look upon. Without trust, then we are not there. Then what are the evolution? If you look at, we have 1G, nobody talking about analog. Now we have go to 2G, 3G, um, even in the 3G, 3G provide a number of services, communication in the bus. Some of us, if you take North Fork Court, I personally use North Fork Court to Montego Bay, you have internet, then the 3G provide those services. Wireless internet in the bus, in the aircraft and in the ship. Now we have LTE, long-term evolution, which is 4G. Well, I think we have 4G presently in Jamaica, but 5G is yet to come. And 5G is something we're expecting. Um, 6G, we're, we're forgotten 6G for 2030. Many other countries have 5G. We have been given approval under the Institution of Electric Electronic Engineers to have, to have 5G summit in Jamaica, but we don't want to have it academics. If you keep 5G summit in Jamaica, presently, it is going to be academic, but we want an uh, opportunity where the industry will harness from it. This is a roadmap. If you look at here, you see how we move from Wi-Fi, WiMAX, all the IEE standard, and presently, and, and we're getting to 5G, even though we never have 5G, and by 2030, we're expecting 6G to be on the air. Blockchain. Why the blockchain? We have a start, a startup, peer-to-peer -peer communication. Then the network is established, and you move to the next layer network. From the next layer network, and we get to the final destination where we are expecting. And that the blockchain is talking about the deployment of 5G. What are the opportunities? What are those key features of 5G? Smart wearables. I do not have my own. We have tags. We can put tags. Especially in animal, we can control animal using tags. We have e-health electronic uh, system to monitor our health. Smart cars, device to device, device to device communication. I like when they mention now JPS. JPS can be able to take their meter reading using remote. They don't need to go to the houses to, to take reading. They can take reading from their offices. And these are the key features in 5G. We see in, in the Internet of 13, mass enhanced mobile network, IoT features. Key features also include enhanced mobile, enhanced Communication. I'm not even seeing the slide very well, but a lot of key features we are going to em embrace when we go into 5G. And not only in ordinary on the land, also on the sea. And that's where we are talking today. We want something that can help a maritime industry in their communication. If we go into 5G in Jamaica, a lot of things will come into play. Um, throughput. Transmission time, propagation time, all of our data enhancement will improve. Also, all the key features in 5G. Yeah. See, the 5G provides three layers. Normal internet has seven layers from the physical layer, data link, network layer. 5G gives us the access layer, the network layer, and the user layer. 
These are the radio access network communication, what we are going to get from the 5G. Uh, network function virtualization. What do you mean by network function virtualization? I can have only one laptop in my office and 10 or 20 laptops on the A. Then they're stored in the cloud, so we don't have to pay for their storage. That's what we call virtual network. Like when, when the students were presenting, I saw one of them speaking on the YouTube. If we are to provide virtual box, he will, the person will be standing physically like this. He might be somewhere, but he'll be on the virtual box. So I think we provide such communication system. We call it virtual box. You are not there. You can be anywhere, but you'll be standing physically like I'm standing and be speaking from the virtual box instead of talking from a recorded version on a YouTube. Programmable, programmable network and network slicing, sharing on a network. This uh, 5G will give us enhanced gigabit, about 60 something, about uh, 71 gigahertz network. And when the frequency is very high, then the time is very, 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 very small. We cannot talk of 5G without security. 5G security seats, cyber security, 5G, 5G enabled. Without security in 5G, then we are, we are looking for something that, we, that makes different from the existing 4G. And this is what 5G is, we offer. These are the, the key features in 5G. Also, key features in the 5G and the threats, some other threats, threat from the attack, threat from the, the hardware threat, the software threat. These are, there, is, there, are, there are all these threats on 5G. 5G network soft will over subdue all forms of threat. See, all these threats are overcome by the 5G, unlike any other network. Okay, here we are looking at the zones. You see zone one, zone two, zone three. These are the way the network we are set up. We see from the zone one, we are talking of the Wi-Fi. Then it moves to the next zone, the WiMAX, which we said mobile, internet, the wireline, and then we, went, we go to LTE, long time, long time evolution, which is a 4G network, and then we are going to the 5G. In summary, anyway, <laughs> my time? <laughs> okay. I, I will let you summarize. Okay, um, in summary, 5G is where we are expecting and where I wish we will go. I, like I said earlier, we are getting there. Rome is not built in a day. We have approval to keep 5G summit in Jamaica. The only problem is the backbone, which is Internet Protocol version 6. If you check the number of persons in the country who are using network devices, our children in the primary school, high school, all of them have devices, and all these devices have IP, Internet Protocol, and five, 30, uh, 32 bits provided by IPv4 cannot be able to be able to handle. Look at the population in Jamaica. Every family has computer, phone, and all of them have IP. Then uh, IPv version 4 cannot be able. This, that's why we need IPv version 6. We are getting there, and maybe by next year, we'll be able to take talking about 5G summit in Jamaica, and then that will be at world level. We are going to bring experts from overseas to keep 5G summit in Jamaica. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, and uh, thanks so much for inviting me to speak at this conference. Um, this is going to be a challenge, 10 minutes for 35 minute presentation I think I've got here. Anyhow, um, I'll whip through things as quick as I can. Does the Caribbean need autonomous ships? Um, well, we'll come to the conclusion there at the end. Uh, presentation basically go through the current IMO degrees of autonomy, um, 
how things are developing with remotely operated vessels, control centers and things, and looking at some of the advantages and disadvantages of autonomy. Just one thing I would like to make clear is autonomy, autonomous ships does not mean necessarily unmanned ships. There's still going to be people around, they're probably still going to have diabetes, they're still going to get injured, and the electric's going to cost quite a lot. But um, maybe there's some of the challenges. Anyhow, there's um, IMU for their scoping exercise, came up with four degrees of um, autonomous vessels. Within the autonomous industry, there's all sorts of discussion about exactly whether these are particularly good or not, but this is what we're using. Uh, degree one, ship with automated processes, much like many ships have already got. Uh, degree two, remotely controlled with seafarers on board. Then degree three, remotely controlled with, um, without seafarers on board. And then degree four, fully autonomous, where the operating system of the ship is able to make decisions, determine actions by itself. That's probably quite a way off. But, uh, just go through these degrees in a little bit more detail. I mean, at the moment, degree one, Things like autopilots, unmanned engine rooms, this kind of thing, are all examples of autonomy being developed. I'm actually just looking into an interesting grounding case we had last week where um, essentially it looks like the captain put the autopilot on, left the deckhand to look out and said, oh, give us a call if an alarm goes off. About two hours after that, they ran into Grand Cayman. So maybe we aren't quite there with autonomy in the case of that vessel. Um, degree two mass, this is where there is quite a lot of development going on at the moment, where you've still got seafarers on the vessel, um, but control is gradually going ashore. The um, picture there, the Yarra Berkland, is fairly well known. Um, basically, ship for carrying fertilizer in Norway. Interesting with the Norwegian connections with the um, CMU. Norway is very much the forefront of autonomous developments. This vessel um, has been operating more or less as a normal vessel. I'm not quite sure exactly what stage they're at, but basically the wheelhouse will then be taken off and left ashore at one end or the other, and the vessel is effectively remotely controlled from there. And then the next stage is the wheelhouse will basically disappear into the middle of Norway somewhere, and they'll be controlling this ship in the fields. So maybe in the Caribbean we'll go from barges and tugs and so it's a tropical ship um, maybe I should have put a seaboard one there um, up to maybe unmanned barges unmanned ships oops uh -huh. oh. it's technology you know <laughs> um, degree, degree three mass well we're already seeing unmanned survey vessels in the um, Caribbean picture on the left there was taken in Antigua probably eight or nine years ago. Small um, autonomous survey vessel going around one of the marinas. Sail drone is shortly coming to do some work for us in the Caymans. Um, the Spitzer tug on the right has been used in Europe. So um, basically these things are happening. Go on as well in Europe, um, foot ferries, the plan is the Paris Olympics is going to be unmanned foot ferries going up and down the Seine to assist with um, transport. Hopefully that'll be successful and uh, help well, prod the industry along. Degree four mass, of course, well, there's robots taking over the world basically, so yes, this is probably quite a way away. One thing where certainly the Caribbean, I believe, can gain a lot is the remote operating centers, things like that. I'm sure there's quite a lot of people up in Europe would quite like to come and live down in the Caribbean and control their ships up there because it's a nicer climate and things. Um, exactly how these operating centers are going to be governed is very much an interesting question because they could be located in a different country to what the flag of the ship is. This presents all sorts of um, challenges and the likes of port state control and things. Just quick go through some other industries. I mean, rail has had autonomy since, well, 1987 in London, before that in other places in the world. Um, things like Miami, um, Move and things 
just been running for years. Interestingly there, it's all fairly short journeys. The longer journeys, certainly in the UK, there's a great reluctance to go to autonomous trains for that. But Similarly with air, I think public perception, you probably wouldn't like your airplane to be flown with no one sitting in the cockpit. Um, it could be done, but uh, that's it. Of course, we are getting a lot of drones and things like that now. Um, other thing, wing in ground um, vessels, they've been around for quite a while and uh, starting to show a bit more of uh, maybe more interest coming there as uh, autonomy develops. Road, well, we've all heard about autonomous cars and uh, the problems, or, and not necessarily the problems with them, but as with media, they always tend to highlight things when they go wrong. But in fact, autonomous cars and things are developing quite nicely. Same as ports, um, Singapore has been very automated for many years now. Mining operations are quite well uh, autom automated. And uh, lead offshore exploration and things. Quick look at some advantages. Could help alleviate seafarer shortage. Um, it'll create land-based marine jobs with more attractive lifestyle to many. Potential reduction, the effects of fatigue and attention loss um, at sea. Computers don't generally get seasick. They don't work very well if you chuck them in the sea, but uh, that's not the idea. Um, autonomous systems are good at monotonous tasks. Uh, reduction in accidents is better observance of rules, probably. Elimination of exposure of humans to hazardous situations. Um, that was one reasonably recent uh, use of autonomous vessels at, after the Togo um, eruption, where Seekit uh, sent an autonomous vessel out in a container from the UK, set it all up just for examining in the crater of the, uh, after the eruption. You wouldn't really want to be sending humans. And um, potential reduction in environmental harm, because all these autonomous systems will hopefully get more efficient routes and things like that, and also just in time delivery, that kind of thing. Um, ships will be able to build, be built with less wind resistance because you won't need the high um, wheelhouses and things like that. Oh. Yes, there are some disadvantages. I guess some would say the loss of traditional seafarer jobs and skills. Um, there is concern still on the technology and sensor reliability. Um, possibility of accidents due to system failures, high cost of technology, communication limitations, cyber security has already been mentioned. Um, and also there is the thing of how well can an autonomous vessel respond to an emergency on another vessel and uh, providing assistance. There's plenty of, um, well, reasonable amount of current guidance going around. IMO hasn't actually produced its code yet, but it's in the workings. We'll see if it uh, sticks to its timescale. Um, the UK Industry Code of Conduct, now in its sixth iteration, um, version 7 comes out shortly. In fact, it might already have come out. But uh, then things like the Caribbean Code of Safety for Small Commercial Vessels, have got a section in there that mentions autonomous vessels, so at least we admit they exist. And then expect people to use the main um, thing. I guess it's getting near the end of my 10 minutes. Uh, <laughs> the next, <laughs> next stage is um, basically IMO's progressing. Um, the mass correspondence group is working. Um, it's not just IMO. You've got UNCLOS, MLC, various other bodies all have to work on it. Um, various work includes who the autonomous master is, because we'd expect a control center situation, a master can control several ships. Um, competencies of what crew are left on board and things, remote control center definitions and all that. Um, <laughs> definition of a remote operator and um, say so it's generally, uh, it needs everyone working together, which I think brings me to another one. It's got to be, well, just the industry. It's good. We have an academic institute working with industry here. We need to get the professional bodies and everything involved as well. I must admit I was a bit disappointed to hear. I think we've only got four Nautical Institute members in Jamaica. 
Trinidad's got 120 something. Um, but it's getting everyone working together. This technology is coming, um, and we mustn't forget the human, though. The humans are very much uh, well front and center of things. And I think questions and discussions have used that time. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank Thank you. you. Have some time at the end. Yeah. Round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. Well done. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. All right, so today I'll be presenting on enhancing port operations through Internet of Things integration. All right, so we first start by looking at our shipping industry, which covers about 90% of our global trade, which was mentioned earlier. And it does not only consist of the ships, but it also includes the ports, terminals, and other related services. Now, these would contribute to directly to about 1.5 million jobs worldwide. Now, for the competitiveness of our ports, it is not only based on an individual sense, but it is also based on being a crucial link in our global supply chain. Therefore, our ports and terminals have to seek effective ways to be integrated into these supply chains. For projections in this industry, the industry is concentrating on being more sustainable and on innovation by adopting new technologies, which would include our Internet of Things technologies. Now, adopting these technologies would be vital as container vessels are getting larger and larger. Therefore, it requires more manpower in order to carry out operations on the port effectively. So this would introduce our smart port idea, which is our essential infrastructures are being automated, our services are being digitalized, and in doing so, we're using technologies such as Internet of Things, big data, and other smart interfaces. All right, so for the Caribbean and Latin America area, Jamaica is currently ranked eighth for its, the number of shipping containers that are passing through our ports. In order for us to, to be better ranked, Kingston Freeport Terminal is currently looking at strategic ways in order to develop their infrastructure. And in doing so, they are looking towards new technological advancements and how these can improve the operations of the port. And in doing so, we took a, I took a look at the Internet of Things technology. Now, what is Internet of Things? So this is basically where different sensors and actuators are connected via the Internet. Now, these sensors, which would be located in our physical sensing layer, they are they are responsible for collecting data in the field. So this would be sensors such as your thermometers that would be monitoring your temperature. And this information would then be transmitted to our network layer, which is in the middle section, where our software would be processing the information from our different sensors and technology processes. So we'll be looking at two technologies further on. Once the viable information from this has been processed, it is then sent to your application layer, which us, the users, would then be able to access information gathered by the sensor. So we would just be getting the necessary information. Now we'd also be having cloud services which is basically storing all of the data collected, and we can always go back and review this data in case of any emergencies or any for auditing purposes. So for our shipping industry, we can use Internet of Things for various different purposes. We can look at real-time cargo tracking, environmental monitoring, uh, we Internet of Things would also aid in unmanned vessels, which were mentioned in the previous presentation. And we can also look at using Internet of Things to be more energy efficient in our port environment. A 
Okay, what? All right. So for our port operations, the main operations at any cargo port would be loading and unloading of the cargo, transporting this within the port environment, and storing in the port yard. Now, in doing so, there are various issues that are faced in developing nations, such as the rehandling and locating of containers, as well as the documentation required for processing these containers as they move throughout the port. So what our technology is supposed to do is to help us make these processes more efficient. Now, in doing so, we have looked at how technology has improved the efficiencies in other major ports worldwide. We look at the top ports and we realize that all of these ports have invested heavily in using technology in their day-to-day -day activities and thus improved their efficiencies. We have uh, the different ports using Internet of Things platforms for collecting data for precise weather and water information. Now this can help them determine when ships should come to berthing as well as how the weather conditions would affect their operations. We also can look at RFID monitoring, which, will, which is a part of the research that I did, and also at predictive maintenance. So instead of waiting on something to go wrong, we can predict when we need to apply predictive. We can do maintenance work on these before we get to that point, so we avoid long down times. So we have been talking about efficiencies. There are different measures of efficiencies at the ports. So we look at average anchorage time, ship turnaround time. We also look at gate waiting time, trucks turnaround times, and the number of crane movements per hour. So the technologies that I have looked at for today includes radio frequency identification which is where we, we would, radio frequency identification would include ta tags placed on each container, and these tags would then broadcast a signal that would be transmitted to a reader, and that would be then transmitted to your computer, so you can always know where your containers are along the port. So the key functionality of RFID in terms of this project is for container tracking within the port premises. We also look at optical character recognition, which is basically automatic pattern recognition. In the sense of our port, we would be using this for automatic identification of containers, which we have, which researchers have shown that this helps to alleviate bottleneck problems at ports. It also improves time utilization and data entry management. So here is where I did a little bit of work on this proposed architecture that we can use at Kingston Freeport Terminal. So the important section here is the middleware where we have, I have decided to use the Oblisk micro, microservice architecture. The importance of this is its ability to be adapted and to be scaled. What that means is that for future technological advancements, we wouldn't have to go back to the drawing board to create a new system. This system is scalable, so we can always integrate future technological advancements within our system. So we can always be upgrading our system instead of having to go back to develop a completely new system. All right, so our OCR technology would be used to confirm that each truck leaving has the correct container based on their identification. Our RFID would also be tracking each container, which would decrease the amount of time that we would need to spend locating any misplaced container along the ports. Using Internet of Things technologies will also increase communication between stakeholders because as we've mentioned, there is a storage comp component of our system and therefore we can always go and recall information when we need to verify anything that has happened throughout our activities at the port. Our recommendations for 
uh, this, from this project is that the infrastructure would need to be improved, installing the sensors and updating our information systems, training the personnel that would be at the port. We'd also have to have collaboration with different partners because there is currently no standardization of Internet of Things protocols in the region. So therefore, we'd have to be collaborating with our neighboring ports in order to carry out this work. And in conclusion, we suggest that the Kinsa Freeport Terminal use the major container ports as a benchmark for adopting technological solutions. And we look forward to working closer with the port to, so that we can have a simulation constructed and our technologies applied to this simulation so that we can see where the port efficiencies would actually be improved. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, can we have a more thunderous round of applause for what was, as I promised you, a power-packed panel. And if, if I start with our final presenter, what we got was an example, a symbol of the kind of work that comes out of the CMU in understanding how to improve efficiencies. We got fabulous things from both Christophers earlier. Um, Captain Balls actually excited me when he started talking about autonomous ships and when he made the point that autonomous ships were not an indication of completely unmanned ships necessarily. Uh, the, the notion of 5G scares a lot of us in the world and, and, and so Mr. Udiaga, what, what, what comes to my mind is that while the technology moves us forward, it's always, that's always the tension with technology, is that while it moves us forward, it gives us a bit of discomfort in some cases, in terms of how we will establish the governance structures that you spoke of, that will enable us to be able to manage these technologies. Many of us have witnessed very recently some of the technologies which would have been created to enhance our lives, starting to encroach on our pedagogy and on the delivery of our classroom material and how people are assessed because of their ability to enable the technology to do so. But what I'm happy about today is that this panel has actually allowed us to start thinking in a very futuristic way. But it's about ingenuity, and it's also about things that can emerge from a developing country space. So what excites me today is that we're talking about, you know, how we can be ingenuous, but how we can also be indigenous. And with that, I will take my leave from the podium. And I'm going to sit right here and encourage you to ask them some questions because my only purpose here today, you know, was to ensure that you heard what they say and that they hear what, hear what you say and so we can engage. So I left 10 minutes, all of 10 minutes for you too, so we can close off at 4 p.m. So I'm going to open the floor. I see Lady Myrna Ellis is ready to go. Is there a microphone? All right. Okay, pleasant good afternoon, everyone. Wonderful presentations. My question is to Wanika. So I listened to you speak about the issues that ports face and the wonderful solutions that the Internet of Things um, sort of uh, presents to solve some of these problems. However, I recall that uh, during the time we were preparing for the research symposium, you had assisted another lecturer who looked at similar things to you, but in her research, she found that while these things, which you call the Internet of Things, present solutions, she found that the problem was really leadership. And I wanted to know if you considered that, because in listening to her presentations and some of the works that, w that she was doing, what she was saying is that the research showed that we didn't have the leaders to make the decisions to go in the direction that you're suggesting. So I just want to hear you on that. Thank you. Well, okay. 
All right, so I did consider that in order to implement this, then we would need the well, uh, the support of persons at the Kingston Freeport Terminal. So I did have conversations with persons, with managers, managing persons at the port. And as mentioned in the presentation, they are looking for technological advancements to implement in their port as they are expanding the the amount of, they are expanding their space, so they are creating a new terminal at the port. And so they are actually interested in looking at how you would implement these new technological advancements in there. So their leadership is on board with wanting these technological advancements. Sorry, so, so Lady Murna, you didn't ask me any question. But I'm going, to, I'm, going to, I'm going to respond in this way, in, in support. Before I do, go ahead. So, you know, I, I know leaders have these wonderful things that they say. But I think when I listened to the other lecturer, she was more talking about their ideologies and what, where their mind is rather than what their lips were saying. That's just what I got from her, but I take your point. Thank you. Prof. No, no, that, that's spot on. So what you just did, um, Lady Ellis, is just like my panelists made me redundant because they didn't want me to come and stand by them. So they all wrapped up in the 10 minutes. You just made my next comment redundant. I was about to make a point that it is ideological. It is a philosophy of the mind for leadership. My own work looked at that, which was really that it was the leadership typology in relation to the particular technology that would drive organizations and, and, well, in my case, destinations forward. So you've hit the nail on the head. Thanks for engaging in that way. Is there another question? Yes, Doc. Dr. Dean. Yes, this is for Captain Ball. One of the things we notice when we're introducing technologies um, is that when they, are, when they benefit legitimate operators, they also tend to benefit illegitimate operators. So my question was, is with these autonomous ships coming in, especially when once you get to level four with no body on board, um, you know where I'm going with this? Illegal drugs, um, all kind of um, human trafficking, all kind of things. And then with no body on board, there's nobody to hold accountable. What are the mechanisms in, in place to deal with the, as I said, the illegal operators and um, holding accountable the operators of these autonomous vessels? Yes, I think that's very much what uh, the IMO is deliberating at the moment. Um, obviously, you can't go and arrest the captain if he's not on board, but you'll, you'll have to be aware of whoever is actually controlling the vessel Yep, they should have some kind of accountability. Like I said, when you get to level four, um, well, it certainly won't be in my lifetime, but that's when sort of robots take over the world. So there's a whole new issue there. But I think levels two and three, it's very much exactly what the accountability of, say, remote operating centers are, things like that. So I mentioned there's something certainly in the Caribbean um, region we're looking at on the port state control aspect of things is how does an inspector go down and do a port state control inspection on a vessel with no one on it? Um, yes, it's all part and parcel of the challenges. They shouldn't put a roadblock in the way of advancing technology, but uh, yeah, and there'll be new kinds of cooks will come out of this. Uh, Doc, and to add again, I don't know why, I'm, why I keep doing this, but uh, it's an interesting question. My my feeling on it, though, is that the research has actually indicated, and this is my pro-systems, pro-innovation mind again, that where systems exist, there is actually a lower probability of some of those other challenges. For example, last year we spoke about border security and, some, and automating that, and that the challenge with border security in large part was the human element. And I'm not an advocate for the removal of humans from processes. What I am saying is that the, 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 there's always going to be a, an opportunity for nefarious activity, but that nefariousness typically originates at the point of humans. And so a lot of what you fear, even though some of it 
will likely happen. The, the proliferation of some of the things that we're seeing happening. For example, some of the things that um, Wanika wants us to engage in. A lot of that controls the ability of an individual to manipulate. Uh, so I think where you may have a bigger challenge is not level four, but probably levels two and three, where there is the ability to influence what the technology does. Uh, so that, that's my thought on it. Yeah, just to add to it, I mean, what this technology is suggesting is that you're relying on communication, you know, 5G or higher or satellite or whatever. So there's one aspect to somebody using it in a nefarious way. But how does the state monitor or control a ship that is being autonomous operated so that, so that it doesn't do what it isn't intended to do? So that's the other side of um, autonomous, autonomous ships. Yeah, I agree with you. So it's the macro and the micro and how that governance framework work, um, is executed, implemented to ensure that we're protected in the process. I take it. Um, is there another question, comment for the panel? I, I'm, going to, I'm not going to assume, Mr. Odega, that they're not asking about 5G because they don't understand it. I'm going to just assume that it is the fear of talking about 5G lest it overtake us. Um, but I could ask you a question, but I'm sure you'd want to have a closing comment for us. In terms of what you think our outlook should be, because I think because I had caught you a little early, you never got to say, and you will sort of have the final word here, what you suggest our outlook should be in relation to this very pervasive technology. I think we should all um, embrace the 5G. I know that initially there is fear that uh, 5G is bringing COVID-19, 5G is bringing that, but we have Wi-Fi at home that have a number of radiation. And if we a number of research went in when, the, when that issue came up, the first time uh, 5G was tested in Australia, 27, I was there in Australia, nothing happened. Uh, COVID-19 is an, an, it's an element a human virus. So it's nothing that a wave can carry any, 5G cannot carry any, any human virus. It's ordinary wave, just like talking of autonomous vehicle. It's go through the wave. It's device to device communication without any link. Well, the importance of 5G in the market is that a number of things, that even in the Ministry of, um, uh, Ministry of um, Science, they are bringing a lot of things, uh, into into network, how they will be able to make number of registrations online, and you don't need to go to the you don't need to go to the ministry to register any of your any of your do any of your registration. How can you do that without expanded bandwidth? And these are the services 5G can offer: better latency, throughput, transmission time. And when we are thinking of any performance, what are we looking at? We're looking at time. What time is the work done? If the work is done in a very, very less time, then we say the work is fine. If 5G is something that working in, in picosecond, picosecond, and that, that means the time, the time for the data to move is very, very small. So if we you talk, many of us have, uh, uh, many of our flash drive in gig, and gigahertz flash drive is ordinarily giving us one nanosecond, one nanosecond. Well, 5G can give us something much more better than that. So I'm of opinion that many other countries are going into 5G. We need also to embrace 5G in Jamaica because it's going to give us a better, more better network. Thank you. The panelists, uh, a bigger round of applause, not thunderous enough. And my 30 second closing is simply this, and it's a shameless plug that the maritime ecosystem of which we speak that requires these engineering solutions and that requires this forward futuristic thinking is one that must be driven by development of the workforce of the future. Now my marketing team knows that we talk all the time about creating the workforce of the future and when we go into our laboratories, we have banners that speak about creating the workforce of the future and we believe that the workforce of the future is a workforce that can exist in a space where technology thrives. It is a workforce 
that can enable itself to peacefully coexist while the technology makes its activities more efficient. So ladies and gentlemen, I leave you with this. We have a world that's emerging, and as this world emerges and as we create solutions, those solutions, while high-tech, must consider the need in some cases for a high touch. Our industry is not removed from this reality. It's not necessarily a highly customer-centric industry in some ways. It's processes, it's systems. But those systems, in many cases, require a higher intelligence, a higher order thinking, and therefore universities such as ours must be in the business of cultivating that higher order critical thinking. I thank you, and I hand the ship back to Lady Johnson. Thank you, Prof, and thank you, panel, ladies and lady and gents. <laughs> yes. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for being such a gracious audience. Ladies and gentlemen, Spartans online, I know that we are live streaming. Thank you. And I'm sorry that you're going to mix, miss those online, the next leg of today, because it closes with some excitement. So this session is officially ended now. I want to say thank you to our production team. They have been marvelous, haven't they? Let's, yes. We are going to head to the peninsula, and um, you are going to see Port Royal for yourself. There is a cruise ship here in Port Royal that we want to take our family. All of you can, those who are our visitors and those who are not mobile, there's, a, there's CMU transport when we go to the front of the conference center. Others, you can, you know, mosey on or we can hop on a boat and go over in five minutes. We didn't make that arrangement. But we are going over to Port Royal to, um, we have been graciously allowed to see the cruise ship here. Right, Prophet helps that our chairman of council is also head of the Port Authority of Jamaica. And then we are going, especially for those who have never seen the campus, to campus to look around and we will finish with um, light refreshment at our festo center auditorium so with all of that excitement we want you to remember that we tomorrow we have a power panel lined up on the built environment and several other interesting and thought-provoking presentations we have an earlier end to the day tomorrow but this evening we are headed east to CMU thank you please give yourselves a round of applause it was a beautiful day I thank President Spencer for being here for the entire day and for closing out with this wonderful panel. Ladies and gentlemen, this session is officially closed and we are headed over to the east. And the wise always head to the east. Thank you very much. <laughs>